It's now my privilege to offer some words of Torah. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. These words were written by F. Scott Fitzgerald in his 1936 essay, The Crack Up. He was talking about history and what he had learned from his own personal journey. But this theory of opposing ideas that today we might call cognitive dissonance, he might as well have been attempting to describe a profound truth of Judaism. Life, Judaism, is about holding opposite truths at the same time. There's a very apt example in this week's double parsha, Acharemot Kedoshim. The Torah presents us with two verses containing really different messages. It's hard to process these diametrically opposed ideas to hold them both at the same time. Is it possible then to retain what Fitzgerald describes as the ability to function while holding both of these verses sacred? Perhaps my least favorite verse of the entire Torah is in chapter 18 of the book of Leviticus. Ve'et zachar lo tishkav mishkevei isha to'evahi. Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. It is an abomination. Those of you familiar with our Saturday morning services here at CBSD know that here and at some other synagogues around the world, there's a new custom of reading this verse in Eicha Lamentations mode as a way of acknowledging the harm it has caused for so many LGBTQ folk. Personally, yeah, I really dislike this verse. I know, there are many different ways to try and interpret it. I've spent a long time studying them, trust me, and I'd be happy to discuss some of them with you at the Oneg later if you'd like. But I have to come back every time to the fact that these words, these painful words, are part of our sacred text. I feel hurt, I feel unseen but it's the Torah, so I keep reading. And in the very next chapter of Leviticus, the text brings us a mitzvah that Rabbi Akiva calls the most important principle in the Torah, ve'ahavta l'reocha kamocha, love your neighbor as you love yourself. I'm really proud to try and live by these words to follow this beautiful commandment. It's pretty easy to consider this, one of my favorite verses in Torah, one that makes me proud to be a Jew. I, I mean, let's face it also, who am I to disagree with Rabbi Akiva? <laughs> so almost simultaneously, we get the best of the Torah and the worst. In the same Parsha, how do we deal with this synchronicity of the best and the worst in the same reading? How do we hold both of these concepts concurrently and retain the ability to function? What do we make of the fact that it's even possible to have a least favorite verse of Torah? Pairing verses that invokes cognitive, dis cognitive dissonance is not, of course, limited to Leviticus. Many of the prophetic writings, the Nevi'im, turn on a dime, or well, a shekel, from doom and destruction to comfort and blessing. The Haftarah we'll read tomorrow morning is a perfect example. In text from the book of Amos, God promises mass destruction. By the sword shall all the sinners of my nation be put to death. Not the most pleasant message. And yet a common theme among the words of our prophets, the Israelites have angered God and so God has decided to destroy the nation. But Amos' prophecy concludes with a powerful promise of redemption. I will restore my people Israel. They shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. 
They shall till their gardens and eat their fruit. I will, and I will plant them upon their soil, never more to be uprooted from the soil I have given them, said Adonai, your God. The threat of the sword and the promise of success and security from the same sacred text. Of course, our scholars notice this cognitive dissonance, even if they didn't have that term yet. A Barbanel, a Portuguese rabbi of the 15th century, wrote a lengthy commentary about this exact issue. How is it, he asks, that despite the nation having sinned, God has not, in fact, destroyed all the Israelites? Even this great scholar finds that question, and all of these questions, hard to answer. And, of course, opposing ideas in the Tanakh are not unique to Leviticus or Amos. We find them frequently, but we're rarely offered a clue as to how to hold them both at the same time. That project was left to us. And of course, cognitive dissonance is by no means limited to writings from antiquity. That's, after all, we got the phrase pretty recently. Speaking of recently, this Wednesday, we celebrated the 75th anniversary of the founding of the State of Israel. As an American Jew, as a gay Jew, my relationship with Israel is fraught. Yes, I love it there, but also, I have a lot of issues with the government. Consider the story of a rabbinical student friend of mine, Marine, a Jew by choice. She is in Jerusalem where she's been waiting for her student visa for over four months because the government is still questioning whether her conversion at a Mazorti synagogue in Paris is valid. And that's one very minor example. And yet, when I think about Israel, I remember the feeling I get as I walk down the ramp into the arrivals area at Ben Gurion Airport. When I enter into a place where I'm not in the minority as a Jew, when I feel this incredible connection between my history and my Jewish identity, a deep sense of joy fills my neshama, my soul. And I breathe in a deep breath of what the Babylonian Talmud in Bava Batra calls Avera de Eret Israel, the heir of the land of Israel. And I just feel different in the best possible way. I can't wait to get to my favorite shawarma spot in Jerusalem, just off Emek Rafaim. So I get in a car. And while we're driving, we pass the Knesset. And how can I not think about the hundreds of thousands of people who are regularly protesting against policies Netanyahu is trying to enact? And I'm infuriated, I'm heartbroken. We spent a lot of time at JTS in the past couple of weeks. We spend a lot of time generally <laughs> talking about this. How can we uphold these two opposing ideas, loving the land of Israel and being upset with the Israeli government at the same time? Classmates pondered whether it's even possible to do so. Some of my friends were not convinced they could. As for me, I think it's essential to be able to hold both of these facts. I know that I can confidently support the protesters and still savor shawarma from Doron. I'm not saying that because the government is questioning my friend's conversion doesn't mean we shouldn't dance the hora. I'm not suggesting that because the Torah tells me not to lie with another man, that I'm precluded from wanting to care about other people. I'm saying that we're Jews, so we have to hold these opposing concepts at the same time. We've done this for millennia. We do it with Leviticus. We do it with Amos. Fitzgerald wrote, 
that the challenge is to hold two opposing ideas at the same time while retaining our ability to function. For me, Judaism is not only about the fact that we have to, but that we get to. We get to talk about these texts, their cognitive dissonances. We get to talk about Israel, whether it's with love or with hate or with indifference. And best of all, we get to be in community uh, with other Jews, as we are doing here, now, tonight, welcoming the Sabbath Queen. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>